All right, uh, thank you, Charlotte. Um, and uh, welcome to uh, the second uh, roundtable uh, discussion of the conference. Uh, this one is titled, Open the Gates, it's Belisarius. Uh, adjudicators, let there be nothing uh, and uh, Byzantine studies. Uh, and this uh, roundtable uh, will feature uh, three uh, gentlemen. Uh, the first one being uh, Dr. David Allen Parnell. Uh, he is an associate professor of history at Indiana University Northwest. He holds a PhD in medieval and ancient history from St. Louis University. His areas of expertise include Byzantine Empire, late antiquity, ancient medieval warfare, and the Crusades. In 2017, he published the book Justinian's Men, Careers and Relationships of Byzantine Army Officers, and he's currently writing a new book called Belisarius and Antonina. He has been a fan of metal since he was introduced to Metallica in eighth grade. Uh, with David, we also have uh, Federico Landini. Uh, he earned a bachelor's in literature from the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan, and is currently a master's student in medieval history at the Alma Mater Studiorum, University of Bologna, where he is writing a thesis on the reception of the Byzantine Empire in metal music. He also has a forthcoming article in the journal Nuova Antologia Militare, titled Flavius Belisarius Epicus Metallicus, lovely title. Uh, in addition to his work and general interest in metal music, military history, and combinations thereof, Federico has also published the article, The Influence of Climate on the Nomadic Population of the Eurasian Steppe, the Case of the Avars and Turks in the journal Information of the Universidad Autónoma de Campeche. We are also joined, and this is a real delight, uh, by the front man of Judicator himself, uh, John Yelland. Okay, so uh, John uh, is a super talented uh, vocalist uh, and songwriter based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and uh, he is part of the band Judicator, which was founded in 2012. Uh, they are a power metal band uh, that uh, just really rocks. Uh, great for fans of Blind Guardian, uh, for instance, uh, though they're Though they're, uh, that latest album, also I hear some good, some King Diamond and Merciful Fate influences too that really, uh, and definitely Let There Be Nothing was one of my albums of the year uh, for 2020. Uh, and I'm really stoked that John, John can join us uh, because uh, 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 John and the gang have been putting the finishing touches on their brand new album, uh, you know, that will be coming out uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, and uh, I'm sure at this point, John is uh, <laughs> uh, has his has his attention squarely on that. But uh, we're very happy uh, that he is gracious enough to turn his attention back to a couple of years ago to uh, talk a bit more about uh, this album. So I'll be quiet now, and I'll turn things over to David, Federico, and John. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our roundtable. I am David Parnell, and I have the, uh, the pleasure of being the first one to speak. Um, I'd like to thank our conference organizers, the illustrious Charlotte and Jeremy, who put together uh, a really beautiful conference, and it's been such an honor to be a part of it. So thank you for, for letting me uh, do this little piece. And I would like to uh, also introduce you all to the format of our roundtable. Uh, there'll be three brief talks. I believe Jeremy called them lightning talks yesterday. Uh, they'll be in the order of me, uh, Federico, and John. Uh, and then we'll have some discussion between the three panelists. We prepared some questions to ask John primarily uh, to elicit some uh, more information. And then we'll open up near the end of the roundtable to questions from the audience. So if you want to put questions uh, in the chat, um, we'll try to keep up with those and, and get to them uh, near the end of the round table. So with that bit of uh, introduction complete, uh, I'd like to uh, begin my own remarks. So this is a examination of the portrayal of the general Belisarius in the album Let There Be Nothing by the American power metal band Judicator. Belisarius is the most famous general of the sixth century. In the service of the emperor Justinian I, Belisarius fought wars against the Persians in the Middle East, conquered the Vandal Kingdom of North Africa, and took most of Italy from the Ostrogothic Kingdom. 
These successes made Belisarius extremely wealthy and famous in his time. Yet Belisarius found it difficult to hold on to that wealth and fame. He argued with his own wife, Antonina, allegedly because she had an affair with their adopted son, Theodosius. This led eventually to the explosion of their nuclear family. Belisarius also fell out with Justinian at various points in his career, experiencing professional disgrace as a result. This interesting biography has made Belisarius a popular subject in art, literature, video games, and as of 2020 in heavy metal. Judicators Let There Be Nothing follows Belisarius through his campaigns in North Africa and Italy with a special focus on Antonina's alleged affair with Theodosius. The lyrics frequently put the listener into the shoes of Belisarius, exploring his emotions, his attitudes towards warfare, his religious belief, including how his faith conditions his interactions with his wife Antonina. It is this last element of the album, its portrayal of Belisarius's faith that I would like to address today. I will come back to the album, Let There Be Nothing in a few moments. First, I would like to consider what we know about the faith of Belisarius from the primary sources of the sixth century. Belisarius was almost certainly a Christian which contemporary sources make clear in a variety of ways. So I'm gonna give you some examples. First, we know that Belisarius fasted on Good Friday ahead of the Battle of Callinicum on April 19th, 531, probably a sign of the depth of his faith. Second, we know that Belisarius stood as godfather at the baptism of his son Theodosius in 533. Belisarius himself raised Theodosius up from the baptismal font with his own hands, demonstrating his commitment to his Christian faith and formalizing his adoption of the boy at the same time. Third, when preparing to depose Pope Silverius in 537, Belisarius allegedly made the quite pious declaration that, quote, if anyone gets involved in killing Pope Silverius, he will have to account for his actions to our Lord Jesus Christ. Fourth, when the new Pope Vigilius was installed later in 537, Belisarius, quote, presented to St. Peter by the hands of Pope Vigilius, a gold cross with jewels weighing 100 pounds with an inscription of his victories. This generous gift is probably another indication of his faith. Fifth, in August of 551, Belisarius was one of a group of emissaries sent by Justinian to piously urge Pope Vigilius to work with the emperor on the religious condemnation of the three chapters. And as a final piece of evidence for Belisarius's faith, I would like to present uh, this lovely lead seal, uh, which is held in the Dumbarton Oaks collection. It is a sixth century seal that bears on its reverse side a cruciform monogram for the name Belisarius. It is not guaranteed to belong to our general Belisarius, but the dating of the seal to the sixth century and the name on it, of course, are suggestive. And importantly for our purposes, the monogram, uh, the seal bears on its obverse side the bust of the Virgin holding Christ flanked by two crosses. So there is ample evidence of Belisarius's strong faith in the primary sources of this period. However, the Christianity of Belisarius has not been a popular subject for modern historians of the general. Historians of Belisarius are usually much more interested in his military career first and in his relationship with Antonina second than they are in his faith. Just a couple of examples. In 1820, in his famous biography, The Life of Belisarius, Lord Mahon summed up the general's faith in a single sentence, quote, that Belisarius held the Christian faith is apparent from his spiritual adoption of Theodosius and from the religious zeal of the emperor who strictly excluded all pagans and heretics from office. 
Apart from this sentence, the faith of Belisarius appears not at all in this several hundred page biography. I want to be more recent, we can go to 2009 when Ian Hughes published Belisarius, the last Roman general. The historian did not refer to Belisarius's faith at all in this book, settling instead for this vague reference to his morality, quote, Belisarius was obviously a man of strong character and outstanding moral bearing. Yet it is not as if modern historians are averse to talking about the faith of sixth century men in general. For example, much ink has been spilled on the question of whether the historian Procopius of Caesarea was a Christian or a pagan, most memorably by Anthony Caldellus in 2004. So having presented some of this evidence from uh, history and from more recent uh, historical monographs, we turn back now to judicators, let there be nothing. As I mentioned earlier, one of the standout features of the album's lyrics is the way they carefully examine the spiritual life of Belisarius. Belisarius's faith is richly imagined in a variety of ways, and I'm just gonna highlight four of them here uh, in the interest of time. On the first track, Let There Be Light, the lyrics refer to the fasting of Belisarius and his army before the Battle of Callinicum, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. Quote, the men were firm, they wanted blood, on this a day meant for the Lord, but bound to fast we tired quick, and so the Persians rolled us up. Later in the song, Belisarius offers up a prayer. Oh my God, hear our prayers, condescend out of mercy, give us strength, give us courage, let us fear you evermore. On track three, Strange to the World, Belisarius has heard about Antonina's affair with Theodosius, and he openly considers whether he can show the mercy of Christ in response to this news. Quote, am I like Christ, who so forgave the adulteress from stoning? Sing, hallelujah. I'll also point out as a metal fan that this song has a fantastic instrumental transition about halfway through the song, which marks the change in Belisarius' mood when he hears the news that Antonina has betrayed him, and it's wonderful. On track seven, The Way of a Pilgrim, Belisarius questions whether the interference of Empress Theodora is God's providence, and he ponders resisting God himself. Quote, and for a brief time I was clear, justice had been served, but then the Empress heard the news and called us to their court, could this be providence of God, resist him. But on track eight, there's a resolution, uh, let there be nothing. Belisarius immediately regrets the temptation to resist the, uh, the Lord. Quote, the power to choose who lives and who will die is not my right. In doing so, I kick the Lord off his seat of rightful judgment over man. God knows I've tried to fight off sinful thoughts. And finally, Belisarius confirms his obedience to God. Forgive me now, I trust your providence. In describing the religious life of Belisarius, Judicator gives us a way to consider how the various aspects of the general's life, his military career, his marriage to Antonina, and his relationship with the Emperor Justinian may have been tied together by his faith. It is an interesting twist on the story of Belisarius which is more often told by both historians and creative types from a rather more secular viewpoint. I look forward to discussing this with John and Federico in a few minutes. And that concludes my brief talk. I now pass the microphone over to Federico so that he can do his. Yes, thank you. So one, just one second, okay. Now this, uh, okay. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, to thank Jeremy for the madness of having me here. And mostly my presentation will revolve around uh, the, the primary source behind Let There Be Nothing, so Procopius. I will give a brief account of the author. Their, his works and their representation into the album. So 
I will start very shortly. First of all, Procopius of Caesarea is the last great historiographer of late antiquity, lived in the sixth century, we, although we don't know precisely the year of birth and the year of death. And a part of his own works, we know very little about his life. And what we know is from the lexicon Suda, and that says that he was a rhetor and a sophist. He wrote a, sorry, I, the, the camera's cover part of my, <laughs> of my, okay, sorry. He wrote a Roman history and uh, the war, about the wars of Belisarius also, and Justinian. Uh, and he also wrote another book, the, the Anecdota, also known as the Sacred, Secret History and another panegyric called uh, the the edifices that talks about the buildings uh, and mil mil mostly military but also civilian uh, built under the reign of justinian the his main work although is the is the wars so with the latin title known as the bellis and they this book, this work, uh, sorry, is uh, the longest historical composition to have survived from late, late antiquity. Uh, they follow the ancient tradition of secular historiography, primarily concerned with military, political, and diplomatic events within the author's lifetime. And we also know that particularly he followed the, the work of Thucydides, the wars are composed by eight books pub published collectively after early 551, though volume eight is a supplementary one and was completed a couple of years later. The mother convention numbers them wars one to eight or Persian war one, two, Vandal war one, two, and Gothic war one to four. For a copy stated theme is the wars waged by are the wars waged by Justinian against the empires and neighbor kingdoms. Most of the action occur on or beyond the Roman Empire's eastern frontiers or in the newly conquered or contested territories in the West. The secret history is the Procopius' most famous piece of writing. Uh, he seemingly conceived this unpublished secret history apparently between 548 and 550-51 as a corrective addendum or alternative version to Wars 1 to 7. He did not divide the secret history into the smaller section we know, but it was the modern editors. Uh, the scholars agree that chapter one to five concerning are concerning Belisarius and Tonina, and they form one thematic uni unit. The, the chapter six to the end have as a center of the, uh, of the narration, Justinian and Theodora. The secret history can be considered a, as a, mostly a piece of gossip, a collection of all the imaginable and unimaginable rumors about Justinian, Theodora, their most prominent helper, General Belisarius and his wife, Antonina. Procopius, no, okay, I already copied that one, sorry. <laughs> uh, the words of Procopius are, the three wars, the Persian war, the Vandal war, and the Gothic war. The Persian war is divided into two. I will cover the second part in, at the end so I can follow the, the structure of the, the album of, from Judicator. Uh, the, Persian, the first Persian war is also known as the Iberian war. It was fought by Eastern Roman Empire and Sassani Persia between 526 and 532 for the possession of the kingdom of Iberia in modern Georgia. It was started by the Emperor Justin I and, Kavad, and the Shah and Shah Kavad I, but was concluded by their heirs, Justinian and Kosroe, with an internal peace that lasted only eight years, or although, and a substantial maintenance of the previous, stat, previous status quo. The casus belli were mostly the denial of the adoption of Kosroe into the 
and into the family of Justin and the revolt of the Caucasian Iberia over fate matters. Uh, also, we know that Beliza this is the first mention of Belisarius because we know in the, that in 527 was promoted as Tux Mesopotamiae and was defeated four years later at Kalinicum. This is a, a map, but we can cover this later. Uh, the Vandal War was fought by also the East, always the, the Eastern Roman Empire and Vandal Kingdom was it lasted merely one year, and the objective was the restoration of African provinces into Roman hands. The Casus Belli was the over, overthrown by Gelimer of the pro Byzantine king Hilderic and the persecution of non Aryan Christians. We know that here Belisarius defeated Gelimer at the Battle of Adlechimum in September 533 and at Tricamarum in December 533. Between those two events, he also occupies the city of Carthage. Also, this is another map. The last one is the Gothic War and was fought against the Ostrogothic Kingdom and lasted 18 years between 533 and 553 for the restoration of Italy under Roman rule also. It can be divided into three different phases. The first one covers the first five years and tells us about the, con the Italian conquest by Belisarius until the fall of the capital Ravenna, mostly the one covered, this phase is covered into the album. Then we have the second phase from 530, 541 to 551 and covers the Gothic reconquest of most territories into the central and southern Italy. And the last one was the, the, the years from the years uh, um, 551 and 553 and covers Narses beating the Gothic king Totila at Pustagalorum and his Erteia at Mons Lactarius. Uh, as a conclusion of this war, Italy is utterly devastated and returns for a few years under a feeble Roman rule until 558 when the, the Lombard invasion stole most of the peninsula from them. The casus belli is the murder of the Gothic queen Amalasunta. And this is a, a map of the first phase. So, okay, then we have in the album another Persian war known also as the Lazic War, was fought between the Eastern Roman Empire and Sasanian Empire for the control of the ancient Georgian region of Lazica. It, this war lasted for 20 years with varying successes and ended in a victory for the Persian who obtained an annual, an, an annual tribute in exchange for ending the war. Here, Belisarius commands the army until 542 with high cautiousness and the, his main achievements have been the conquest by siege of the fortress of Cisaranon in 551, 541, and the repelling of the Shansha Kosroe one through some trickeries in 532. Uh, we also, I, uh, now I will cover the wars in letter B, no, of course. Uh, the Persian war, we have the Battle of Kalinicum fought in 19th of April of 531, and, and it's shown in the track one, letter be light, but the album doesn't talk about the war, just it's only its aftermath, so we can see the Persians swept into our lands and on Easter day we came in range, the met, sorry I was singing and I was not talking. Then we have, <laughs> The Vandal War that covers the first four tracks of the album. We have in Letter Be Light, we have a, an idea of why Belisarius is going to Africa because Arala Hilderic is being imprisoned and the, our destiny is to liberate our kinsmen has, who has of now faced persecution. Then we have the Battle of Addecimum that is shown in track two, Tomorrow's Sun, as we can see, uh, we correct arrive at, at the Chimum. And our outside Carthage, my good friend John, 
and kill the king's brother. This is a map of the idea of the battle. Then we have, we really don't have the battle of Tricamarum, but I, I, I also cover this because I, I, I think that here in, in the album, the battle of Ad Dechimum uh, is a, a is most mostly covers both of the battles in the idea of the of the in the structure of the story told by by John. Then we have the the death of John the Armenian that is shown in the track tree. Strange to the world, a messenger approaches and says that John is gone. Then we have the Gothic War that covers the song four to six. So in, in the song four, we have the Siege of Naples. In the, uh, in the track five, Gloria, we have one episode of the first Siege of Rome that lasted from March 537 to March, March 538. And we have in track six, another episode, uh, the defeat of Belisarius at Fields of Nero. Then lastly, we have the in track six, uh, the, the Persian War and the Siege of Cisauranon, where we John shows that Belisarius is now waging war in the eastern uh, in the eastern uh, front. And then that's honestly all I've taken very a very long share of your time. So I and I I stop here and pass the word to, to John. So that there is in, interrupt. Sorry, I was terrible. Uh, John, you're up. We'd love to hear from you next. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I just got to say uh, that, uh, well, first off, I, I ended up getting uh, my boy here. I, I got put on baby or dad duty. Um, so there's the potential that this could uh, test my patience and focus, but I, I'm feeling optimistic. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I am extremely... Um, uh, humbled and excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> to me, this is sort of the ultimate validation <laughs> because I've always tried to write history and present history in a way that is uh, um, respectful to the truth of what happened and to the, the reality of these people's lives. Um, I'm very sensitive to the fact that, you know, whether I'm covering Frederick the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, the Crusades, or Belisarius, um, these are real people we're talking about, and these are real people who lived and died. And uh, so I'm just really, really grateful, and I'm chuffed to bits that I have uh, such an esteemed group of historians and academics who are uh, noticing or taking a look at the work that I've poured so so many hours into and uh so you know I, i've always thought that uh i write music or I, I write lyrics for historians but i want regular people to enjoy it as well so it's really cool that historians are actually starting to uh to to like it and you know validate it you know i, I put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that the lyrics and vocals are as catchy as possible and uh, approachable as possible but uh that a historian could read through them and be like oh yeah this is uh right or at least mostly right because you're gonna have to take certain liberties when you're adapting something like this um so yeah i mean uh regarding the uh presentation by uh david parnell doctor um, okay, well, uh, 
I, I'm going to say doctor. I, I think it was he was doctor, but Dr. Parnell, um, his uh, presentation on the spirituality of Belisarius. Uh, that was interesting because I hadn't even thought of that, but um, now now I, I, I totally see why that's unique and come to think of it. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I wanted to include those elements in the album because number one, I was going through a sort of spiritual journey of my own and Belisarius was somebody uh, through whom I could kind of explore my own spiritual journey, but also having covered historical figures before, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, Frederick the Great, and the people surrounding Frederick the Great, um, Godfrey de Bouillon, and uh, some of the other figures from the First Crusade, um, I, I kind of got tired of covering battle plans and battle tactics and talking about glorious battle and valor and that kind of thing. And there's a place for that. But uh, I, I really liked and enjoyed spending time with Belisarius, who is somebody uh, who I think is a little bit more human compared to some of the other figures I've covered. Um, very relatable. And that, I think, is a strength in the lyrics and story of Let There Be Nothing. By the way, I can rant, so if at any point, Charlotte, you feel the need to give me a 10-second 10, 10 warning or something, <laughs> uh, feel free. You're doing great, John. We, we, we appreciate hearing from you and hearing the context. I wonder if you might say a little bit about how you went about writing the lyrics to Let There Be Nothing, um, which sources you decided to consult and, and why you decided to consult them. Um, yeah, so to be honest, my journey started, I, I always start wide and then go in. And what I mean by that is um, I follow a YouTube channel called Extra History or Extra Credits History. And I saw their presentation or video series on Justinian and Belisarius. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. Um, because I had always been attracted to Roman history and then later East Roman Byzantine history. Um, and I had been familiar with Justinian and I had a positive impression of Justinian, but it wasn't until watching that uh, YouTube video series that I became more familiar with Belisarius. And so going wide and then honing in, I uh, quickly acquired Ian Hughes book um, I acquired Procopius uh, account of things. I also then later acquired <laughs> a book called, I forget the author, but the book is called Antonina, a Byzantine slut, forgive me. Um, but that was an interesting book. It's a book that takes a sort of, a, I guess you would say feminist uh, approach to the story. And he takes he kind of does the same thing that I was doing, but on a bigger scale. He kind of tries to novelize uh, Belisarius' story through like Antonina's eyes and uh, kind of turn it into an, a book or a novel. And that was interesting. Uh, I did read through uh, the secret histories, um, but I did not want to use that as a source just because if I want to know what somebody's all about, I think it's important to know the negative, but uh, I, I would rather go with something that isn't so, to me, explicitly like, you know, motivated and charged. So th those are my main uh, influences or sources that I drew from uh, when creating the album. Uh, did that answer the question? <laughs> oh, more more than answered it. That was really oh, fascinating. Okay, great. I'm I'm very interested right now in how professional historians can help um, creative types that are interested in history to, to use our research in their creation. So it's really interesting for me to know that progression you went through YouTube channel to mm -hmm. relatively popular secondary history to primary history. That, that's, that's very helpful, I think, and probably something that we can all be thinking about and how we can deploy our expertise in a way that is helpful for um, lyricists and others who want to create like this. Yeah, and I would say that, that that's an exciting idea. Like if I were to wave my magic wand, you know, it would be great to have sort of a relationship between um, the, the historical side of academia and 
creative types. I, I hesitate to say Hollywood, but uh, kind of what you're describing sounds like a really exciting arrangement because I, I, being uh, such a, a an enthusiast of history myself, I see how much potential there is, how many fascinating stories there are. Um, and it would be nice to see more of that happen. I mean, we don't get period pieces very often. You have like Ridley Scott's Kingdom of Heaven, uh, Ridley Scott's uh, The Last Duel. You've got a number of others, but I, I think you could definitely have more. And it would be interesting, engaging stuff. It's not dry and boring. It doesn't have to be. I completely agree. And I, I could talk about this for a long time, but that's not the sole focus of our panel. So I'll try to allow sure. room for, for other discussions. Federico, would you like to ask John a question about his, his use of sources or anything that you talked about? No, you stole that one from me. So <laughs> I cannot do it again, but I have another one. So, uh, Considering the difference between the initial medium that is a book, substantially, and the final medium that is a city, how did you tackle the process of transformation from one to the other of the story? How did you choose what to keep entirely, what to adapt or move chronologically? Because as I, as I uh, and, what to, and what to ignore, because as I said before, uh, in the album is shown only the Battle of Ad Decimum, but, and then we go directly to Carthage and the death of John the Armenian. But we know from Procopius that the death of John the Armenian is after the Battle of Tricamarum, that is after the, 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 the after they entering Carthage. And I think that in the, the album Ad Decimum covers both Ad Decimum and uh, Tricamarum as you no know, war event. Yeah, I think that is an awesome question. And it's a question that I've been waiting to be asked for a long time because I've been doing this with uh, Judicator since 2012. Like I said, Napoleon, Frederick the Great, uh, the Crusades, and now uh, Belisarius. So this isn't the first time I've done it. And what I would say is that's that's the question that any good filmmaker uh, or creative type needs to ask him or herself when adapting uh, this kind of thing. Um, because like I said earlier, you want to respect the people who uh, lived and died. You want to respect the truth, but you also want to respect the audience. And so that means you want to have um, the story be engaging and you don't want to overstay your welcome. Um, with a movie adaptation, you have, with a story like this, you probably have two to three, maybe three and a half hours if you're talking something like Ben-Hur. <laughs> but generally you'll, you'll have like two to three hours to condense an entire event it could be a lifetime it could be a year whatever but it's going to be huge and so condensing all of that into an album which is like 60 minutes is an even bigger challenge i think and yes, because there you don't have the visual side of the of the themes yeah in, in a film you can show don't tell here you have to tell mm -hmm. and, and, and only that and, and like uh, it was pointed out with Strange to the World, you know, I, when, when Alicia was in the band and she would write all of the music, we would be relying, she would give me all of the music and then I would arrange all of the songs into a flow that I think fit the story that I wanted to tell. And uh, I would have to sort of rely on these musical changes, like with Strange to the World. It's like you, you have this song structure and I have to take that natural soundscape and form the story being told in the song to that in a way that makes sense. So if there is a moody section, I want to amplify that by singing about something moody. And the extra challenge that I brought upon myself was I'm a, a, a film enthusiast, a film analysis enthusiast, and I am very passionate about story editing. Uh, so what I wanted to do with this album is something that I don't think has ever been done before. 
Um, and I make, I, I say this publicly and I've said it before, and it's uh, sort of not an open challenge, but an open question. Um, because what I did is I took my, my story and I wanted to conform it to a, an eight act story structure, which is a structure in film commonly used by filmmakers to sort of use as a template. It, it's a time proven, time tested structure that works for audiences and for effective storytelling. But I wanted to do that with an album. So to my knowledge, we're the only band to have ever made a concept conform to an eight act story structure. I mean, heck, there's eight songs, it's perfect. But um, yeah, I mean, so one of the challenges was find, was, was selecting a beginning and an end, which is more challenging than you might think, because those have to be related. You have to have uh, the, the, the beginning state of affairs has to change and there has to be a growth undergone in your character. And it has to be about one or two things. It can't be this convoluted mess. It has to have direction. So picking a beginning, an end, a first culmination, a second culmination, everything is in there and I'm super happy and proud of it. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I'm beginning to get a little bit sensitive. I don't, I don't know if I'm ranting too much now. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's okay. No, I, I think that I've seen these beginning and these endings in, in the album because we start with a defeat and we close with a defeat, oh, both in the military sense and both in the personal sense. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, a similar thing uh, you know, the, the battle outside of Rome is similar to the Battle of Callinicum. Uh, yes. So you have, a, a, you, ha you have the planting and the payoff, but the twist on the payoff is normally a planting and a payoff. You have a, a, different, um, a different outcome. So if you, you do A this time, then you do A, B the next time. Um, but I thought that was interesting to, because not only is it true, but I, I think it's true to life. You know, we have these programs and patterns of behavior that repeat throughout our life. And it's something that we struggle against for our whole life. You know, if you have an addiction or uh, a, a personality uh, pattern, it doesn't just go away. You don't just magically become the hero like in the Disney movies, you know? These are things you have to struggle with your entire life. And I've noticed a lot of times, um, I may be reading too much into this, but I think people in general, I feel this way, you have a sort of set of themes of your life. So there's a, a, a set of themes in Jeremy's life, in David's life, Federico, Charlotte, Carolina. Um, and so I, I definitely see that in myself. I saw that in Belisarius and I wanted to, that so, set of themes is sort of what informed me to make this album's central themes, you know? Yes. I don't know if David wants to go. Yeah, I, I, would, like to, I would like to invite questions from, from our audience. I don't know if anybody has maybe chatted. Jeremy, I don't have any questions on my screen, but if you have any questions, start loading them into the chat and, and I'll ask uh, John one more thing while we're waiting for a couple of questions here. Uh, I just want to return to my, my question about faith. And I want to know what you made of this sort of discrepancy that I discovered that professional historians seem maybe disinterested is not the right word, but they don't make Belisarius's faith much of a focus, even though we actually do have quite a bit of evidence that he was indeed a, a pretty faithful individual. So I wondered what, what your take was on that, because I think I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that you and your lyrics have written more about Belisarius's faith than probably <laughs> any professional historian in a published work up to this point. Like I'm, I'm not exaggerating here. So I'd, I'd be curious to know why you think that's the case. Like, why did you see this and make it a focus, but professional historians have not? Um, that is a good question. And I think it might be, this is speculation. I do not know. So all I can do is take guesses, but I think in general, uh, academia is more of a secular landscape. And I think that people may not want to grapple with Belisarius' faith because it was such an integral part 
of his life. And I think it informed so much of uh, what he did. And, you know, I, it's like I've covered other historical figures like Napoleon. He was not a friend to religion, uh, you would say. Uh, Frederick the Great, he had his struggles. The Crusades, how about that for a, uh, a, a tricky topic? But I don't want to run away from these. Like if I were to do the album about Kusro, I would want to find out what makes him tick and what his core values were. I think that the faith of Belisarius is something that struck me just because you see how it manifests in his actions repeatedly. And uh, that's something that I wasn't able to see as much with Napoleon, who didn't strike me as a, a religious person. Um, same with Frederick the Great. Um, I think I'm getting a little bit off base here, but yeah, I, I, I could only guess that it's because the people writing these books are secular and maybe they don't want to grapple with or go into detail. Um, because, you know, you, you have no shortage of examples of religiosity gone wrong. You have no shortage of uh, Spanish inquisitions, of Christians and Muslims butchering each other. You have no shortage of bad examples of religiosity. But I think Belisarius offers a pretty good example of religiosity. And um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, John. We've, we've got some good conversation going on in the chat about uh, this. Is about... it all right for me to step in a little? Um, Please. Because we're chatting about it in the, in the chat. So I think there is a real difficulty, and, and Sham has just said maybe metal studies is more of a bridge than we think it is, because early Christianity studies do talk about the faith of these figures, but we are sort of annexed weirdly in academia into theology, even though we don't really do theology, we do history and we do textual studies and we do kind of linguistics and that's what we're doing. Um, and so classics and theology have sort of parted the ways, which means that, yeah, there's an idea somehow that anything about faith is about individual belief. Whereas in the ancient Mediterranean, faith is performative. It, it can't be separated from what you do. It's about, what you're doing in the city, in the polis, as much as it is about what you're doing in your kind of internal life. And there is a real problem, I think, particularly from sort of the 19th century onwards, of talking about ancient figures through a post-enlightenment idea of religion <laughs> and, and faith. And so you get this kind of like division where secular historians will talk in secular ways and then only religion just people willing to address this religiosity but actually personally anyway from my study of the kind of faith in the ancient in the sort of mediterranean in the first few centuries those things are not separable it, nobody has personal faith it's not a thing communal faith is a thing but personal like i assent to a belief in jesus christ it happens but it there's no way you can keep it personal if that makes sense so I would say that maybe it's not directly addressed in the history books as kind of Balasaris' faith, but if you think of religion as what people do, which is what it really is, rather than what people believe, then it actually is addressed in lots of ways. Does that make sense? I'm kind of going around in circles, but... I I, I, I've read a lot that confirms what you've said, and uh, I think that was a much more uh, coherent explication. <laughs> I, I thank you. That that was uh, that was great. Yeah, and as Jeremy noticed in the chat, also we're we're also reliant on a source who is explicitly classicizing and attempting to hide discussions of Christian faith whenever possible. So even though we we see bits and pieces of Christianity of Belisarius poking through, for example, in the wars, it's not a major focus. Uh, and maybe if Procopius had written the ecclesiastical history he promised us, we'd have a little more direct evidence, but he does not seem to have got to that. So we have a question from Vasilis. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to offer a, perhaps a, another uh, opinion on why we don't know much about Belisarius's religion. And um, I think um, one significant factor is that uh, he wasn't really a controversial uh, figure uh, regarding religion, or he didn't play any serious part in uh, religious controversies. Um, 
while Justinian, on the other hand, or Theodora have uh, their share of um, rumors about what the actual leave of the world may have you see this or, uh, or orthodox or whatever. But there's nothing on Belisarius and I just assume that he was just another typical orthodox of his time. So nothing to uh, write home about, basically. Yeah, and that might be a good point, too, because, you know, I've read about all of the ecumenical councils and stuff, and there's plenty written about that. Uh, I even have a theological book by Justinian uh, or on Justinian's theology. And so, yeah, I think that's a, a really good point as well. Shama, we'd like to hear from you. Sorry. Uh, um, John, this, this is a question for you. You talked a little bit about the personal... The, the stuff that you were going through that you felt you were channeling through uh, writing this album. Um, I don't know if you know, could you talk a little bit about the reception of the album, like beyond just people saying it's great, which we've heard a lot and it is, uh, but more just like have, have people related to the topic in ways that you anticipated or ways you didn't anticipate, you know, uh, Byzantium is not overly uh, represented in metal, I would say. Um, so anything you could say on that would be really interesting, just a kind of popular reception of the topic. Yeah, it's it's not a subject that in my experience has been uh, very deeply taught in the West in general. Um, I remember I took world histories in high school and Byzantium was touched upon, but there was no, like I, like I said, I was a fan of Roman history. And when I got out of high school, and started doing my own research instead of what was uh, being uh, given to me by the school, I realized, oh, like Rome actually kept going, you know, in, in some form at least. Rome didn't really end until 1453. Uh, but as far as the, the, the actual question uh, regarding the reception of the album and that kind of thing, it's been interesting because with the album that came before this, it was very quick. It's like a 42 minute album. All of the songs were fairly punchy and short. And then this album comes out, we decided to do kind of the exact opposite. We did almost all of the songs are over the five minute mark, they're longer songs. And then on top of that, you have a uh, subject matter that is uh, not alienating, but uh, harder to relate, I guess, because not everybody is familiar with uh, Byzantine history. Uh, not everybody likes seven to nine minute songs. Um, so this album is actually to date the most, uh, I guess you would say critiqued album we've had so far. Um, and that's fine. I've been listening to this album maybe three times start to finish since we, uh, since, since in, in preparation for this and I've found, I actually really am proud of the album. I think it's great, but uh, it, I, I think being conscious of that, I tried to make <laughs> Belisarius as relatable as possible. And when I say that, I don't mean that I was changing fundamental things about him. Like I said, I've tried to be very uh, true to him, but you know, it's, it's harder to get people to identify with a uh, sixth century Eastern Roman uh, general compared to like our third album, which is about my experience with uh, my brother losing his battle with cancer. You know, that is something that so many more people can relate to. But um, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. We have a great follow up to that, John, uh, in the chat. We have a question from Amanda. She asks, how do we get people to engage with histories that are not normally told? Do you think you will use your band platform to tell stories and histories that are more unknown or untold? That is a fun question because I've thought about that before. You know, I, we started out with Napoleon and that was a, a fun, really cool, interesting album, I think. But then we did Frederick the Great and like nobody in the US at least uh, knows about Frederick the Great. Um, and then we did uh, the Cancer album and then we did the, uh, the Crusade album, which again is a little more uh, well known. Um, so I think we already have uh, covered 
topics, historical topics that are not as uh, well known. And I would like to uh, popularize this, you know, to the best of my ability. Um, that being said, uh, regarding future plans, I the the next album coming out uh, is not historical, but after that, I think I would like to return to history. And so, topics that have come up um, for me, I, I think Heraclius would be a really interesting character to cover as well. Um, and then I've had it in my back pocket. I, I would love to do an album about the American West. Uh, I, I have very romantic, or ro the American West to me is very romantic in the sense that you probably know I'm talking about, like romanticizing. I love the American West. So uh, I think there's a lot to tell there as well. But yeah, I, I agree that we, there, there's so many wonderful stories out there that could and should be told and popularized. There's some support for a Heraclius album in the chat. So <laughs> consider that to be a popular choice. So I, I'm just curious, following up on that, how do you decide whether an album is going to be historically based or not? Since your newest one coming out is not, and then you're going to try to go back to it. Is it just sort of a matter of feel? Are you deliberately trying to alternate or? Um, so we started out doing, uh, you know, we're the concept album band. Every album we do is conceptual. It's a concept album. Uh, but there was no plan originally. It was, let's do an album on Napoleon. And then, oh yeah, maybe we'll do an album on Frederick the Great. Um, and then we broke from that trend by doing the album about cancer. Um, so I, I think what we have kind of fallen into, which I think is good, is a pattern in which we do two albums that are history-based and then one album that's just out of left field, whatever. And as far as I can tell, I would like to continue that um, because I, I don't, I love history, but I don't want to always write about history. There's other stuff that I want to cover creatively. And so I think two, one, two, one is a, a good way to go about it. And the other thing too is the, uh, so Frederick the Great and Napoleon are uh, somewhat related um, in time period and uh, everything. And then the last emperor our album about the crusades is somewhat related to uh belisarius um, i've even seen it written that uh justinian's reconquest or attempted reconquest was something of a proto crusade so i i, I would like to continue to have these album pairs let's say uh be related in some way so if I were to do the next album after this one that's about to come out on Heraclius, then I would want to find something that is at least somewhat connected to Heraclius. Wonderful, John. This has been so fascinating and interesting, and we're, we're so glad to have you here for these insights. It is the top of the hour, so I suppose I will hand it off to our conference organizers to make any remarks they want to make before we move into our social hour. Yeah, um, you know, we can continue this conversation, uh, you know, uh, into uh, the social hour now, um, as we did uh, yesterday with our previous round table. So, um, you know, David, Federico, John, if you want to stick around and anyone else uh, to chat um, this time, uh, we can totally do that. Um, but uh, anyway, I'd like to, on behalf of Charlotte, I'd like to formally thank uh, David, Federico and John for their time and uh, their uh, energy uh, putting together this uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, and it just provided us a lot of fascinating uh, insight into the creative process of um, you know, creating an historically themed concept album um, with that level of, um, of mindfulness of uh, uh, that. It's just, <laughs> this is, I live for this shit, 